delighted that our panelists can be here to talk about the achievements and failures of the struggle and the victory of the counter-revolution. We've got a very diverse panel here to debate tonight. We have Gary Donnelly, who is a member of the 32 County Sovereignty Movement and a very active community development, good relations and peace building activist, including as part of his role within the Craigan Community Collective. He's also an independent Republican councillor on Derry City and Strabane District Council. We have Julia Key, who has been uh, 20 years in the making, community development activist and good relations, peace building, another worker. Last year, she was High Sheriff of London Derry, and she currently works for YMCA Ireland. Bonnie Weir is joining us virtually from across the pond. She's a professor of political science at Yale University, and she specializes in Northern Ireland in its current context, including the conflict. And she's working on a number of projects at the minute, including policymaking projects with the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. And finally, we have Ray Bassett, who's a former retired Irish diplomat. He was uh, ambassador from Ireland to Canada, Jamaica, and the Bahamas, and he's currently a senior fellow for the EU Affairs at the Center Right Think Tank Policy Exchange. So thank you to all of you for joining us in what I hope will be a very, very diverse and wide-ranging debate. So the first question that I'd like to ask everyone, starting with you, Julia, is what would you see as the main achievements and failures of the struggle? And would you characterize it as a victory of counter-revolution? Um, Kat, <laughs> is there any um, victory in armed struggle where there's mass destruction of, of lives? You know, um, mm. I don't see there being any victory at all in, some, in a war that was so savage um, and that just took people out and mainly working class people um, and discriminately. Uh, and it's just cited people against one another um, at a time in society, w when society and, and its context was broken after the First World War, where people were talking in um, recent contexts about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And we can only imagine the, how, how massive uh, a social problem that could have been at that time and how people played, um, both uh, the British and the Irish, uh, played on those people that were suffering um, for their own ends. Now, um, I don't believe it was a victory in any sense. Um, Northern Ireland was formed, in my opinion, as a part of it. And I know we're going on to talk about that maybe later. And I don't know whether you want me to discuss it now. But in that context, um, Irish Protestants, um, what were they to do and where were they to go? You know, um, at that time, it was all about a Catholic state for Catholic people. Um, and we all seen what the Catholic Church did to the Catholic people. If we had a state, a part of a United Ireland or a, a Republic, um, what would have happened to the Protestant, the Irish Protestant people, you know, if Northern Ireland hadn't have been formed? Everybody deserves at every level somewhere safe to go, a roof over their head, somewhere they, where they feel as if they're not going to be um, murdered practically in their beds. So um, to me, Northern Ireland was formed on that context, in that context um, about supporting people that wouldn't have, wouldn't have had support in a Catholic state for Catholic people. Um, so there's no joy in war, there's no victory in war. Um, I don't believe any good necessarily came out of it. Um, and I suppose that's, that would be my stance generally, um, on armed conflict. I'm not a believer in it. Um, and I'm a firm believer in dialogue. I'd be criticized for being here today. Um, talking openly um and i will be criticized for doing it however i believe that dialogue is the way that we need to we need to engage through dialogue because that only it only adds if we don't talk iron out what the issues are um 
it only it, it'll only lead to conflict again and i say that quite seriously um decisions that are made make people angry and anger leads to conflict and um we need to instead of get instead of getting angry we need to try and understand more Thank you very much. Gary, the same question to you. Well, you know, the, when people talk about the, what some people call the war of independence, you know, it it's, it's, wasn't the war of independence, it was the, the, the Tan War. Uh, we haven't got an independence. Uh, there's not much to cheer from, you know, it didn't achieve its objectives. The objectives had the republic that has been established, that had been proclaimed in 1916, hasn't been uh, established on on uh, on the island. Uh, it wasn't a sectarian war. Uh, you know, sectarianism has no part to play in in, in republicanism. Uh, was there sectarian attacks or, or you know, instances of sectarian? Yes, there was on, on all sides. But I think the, the whole issue of, of sectarianism was, you know, where did it emanate from? It emanated, it's been a, it's an age old tactic that has been uh, designed and used by British imperialism. It was transported and placed in the Irish context in order to they divide and uh, they divide and conquer. So, you know, when we read, when we look at the proclamation, you know, and, and, and uh, for its time and, it's, and, and still it's a very progressive document and, and it talks about, you know, cherishing all the children of the nation equally. It, it, it's not a, 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 a you know, a, a document that, that comes down on a, a, any particular uh, Religion. I don't think that that sectarianism sectarianism is is contrary to the uh, republican ideals and and should should be given no quarter what whatsoever. Uh, and I believe the great extent that disempowered the 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 working classes when the the free street was uh, constructed and was basically consolidated as a a capitalist neo-colonial uh, state uh, and you had the whole legitimizing of uh, partition so unfortunately for me there's not a lot to, to cheer about. Bonnie the same question. I suppose I would agree with essentially the spirit of what both Gary and Julia said. Um, in my understanding of republicanism it is antithetical to sectarianism at the same time there were a lot of tragedies that obviously happened there was a lot of there was exodus there was violence against the protestant population in the south um i think for me the biggest the biggest tragedy that sort of lasted and on until present day, which really doesn't do any justice to the people of Ireland, North or South, is the fact that um, that war resulted in a confessional state in the South, a sectarian state in the North, institutions in both places that one could say are not entirely accountable or democratic. Um, the legacy of voting according to what side you were on which has resulted in sort of the really dysfunctional development of left-right politics in ireland so you haven't seen a lot of progressive cohesive mobilized left-wing movements that have been able to be successful in politics in either the north or the south i think in part in great part because of this you see the emergence of the far right in recent, well, there's always been a, a problem with the far right in, in Irish politics, but I think that it's, it's reared its head in a particularly um, visible form in, in recent months. Um, and it's 
making these appeals, I think, to republicanism that are able to confuse people because of the dysfunction of the left-right politics as it's played out historically since the war um, in early 20th century Ireland. So for me, the biggest legacy is the lack of democratic institutions, the dysfunction of left-right politics, and I haven't gone into you know, the nefarious and lasting effects of the economy, especially in border areas for, you know, of partition. So I, I don't, I think that obviously there was, there was nothing good that came out of, that came out of the, the war. You nearly predicted the next question. So I'll ask Julia first, um, in terms of the, the actual phraseology that Bonnie's just used, would you agree that the war ended in the reactionary foundation of a state divided on sectarian lines and a confessional state? It was, of course it was a state that, that was based on sectarian lines. And um, like, I just want to go back to um, that sectarian. Like, sectarian structures were also set in by the Catholic Church, uh, very much so. You know, um, my my great grandfather, my great great grandfather, my mother's side was trained to be a priest and came out of the Catholic Church because of that very reason, you know. So that shared history too, as well, runs within me, um, and there's shared history within everybody in Northern Ireland, I think. But um, that uh, the sectarian uh, Protestant Irish Protestants needed a safe place, um, you know. Where how were they going to be safe in a Catholic state for Catholic people? Um, you know, every child needs a safe home. They need a roof over their heads. They need warmth. Um, that goes for wraths of people as well. You know, it's like the basic, it's like a basic human right. We need what the Catholic Church did, did the Catholic people. What would they have done the Protestant people in that context? You know, and we always have to go back to the social context and remember that we're, we are just after the First World War where half of the men in Ireland were suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and probably didn't know half of what they were doing, half the male population. Half of them were suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and families were kept being killed in their beds and their homes and their safe place, places. It, it was the institutions uh, and it was um, that fed it, that fed, that fed that like men being killed in their sleep. Well, Full families being wiped out, you know, male lines of families being wiped out. Um, you know, at the, at, where where were people going to go? Where was their safe? Where was their safe place? They weren't even safe in their homes anymore. You know, so where Irish Protestants? Where was their safe space, or where was their safe place to go? And to me, whenever I think about it in that social context, I can see quite clearly why Northern Ireland was formed. Um, other people would talk in economic contexts, but everybody's basic human right is to feel safe um, and to have somewhere to go and call home. And I think that's the essence for me, and probably uh, as it, maybe it's a bit romantic, but the essence for me is Northern Ireland was formed because of that. Gary, the same question. There's absolutely, look, there's absolutely no doubt that the, the island was divided along uh, sectarian lines and, and it was very cleverly thought out. Uh, there was a number of factor, but factors involved in that, but it was the divide, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, divide and conquer. It was the divide of working classes, uh, uh, you know, and it's fostered ever since. It has fostered a culture of, of them and us. And successive governments on both sides of that of that border, and in and in, in the UK did very little to heal that uh, divide. It in fact it, it sort of suited a lot of the agendas. Uh, religion has been used on on all sides to reinforce uh, sectarianism. It's a uh, you know embedding religion in, in various constitutions and structures of the state meant that. It became, uh, you know, unnecessarily entangled with sovereignty and, and and identity, and you know, I think we, you know, when we look, we have, to, you know, we have a national flag, 
and it and 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 it, and the colours of it. You know, it's not just it, or it shouldn't be just symbolic or pay lip service to it. I, I want to make I want to if, if you bear with me, I want to make a quote from from an Anglican theologian, John Austin Baker, who was a former uh, bishop of Salisbury and who was a who was a chaplain to the Speaker of the British House of Commons, who in a speech in, in Westminster Abbey in December 1980 said that no British government ought to forget that this perilous moment, like many before it, is the outworking of a history for which our country is primarily responsible. England seized Ireland for its own military benefit. It planted Protestant settlers there to make it strategically secure. It humiliated and penalised the native Irish and their Catholic faith. And then, when it could no longer hold on to the whole Ireland, it kept back part to be a home for the settlers' descendants. A non-viable solution for which Protestants have suffered as much as anyone. Now, that's not a statement coming from a Republican propagandist. That That is, is in effect... You know, when we look at sectarianism and, and, and the deaths of, 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 of Catholics, or, you know, there's no good side to sectarian. If, if, if somebody is, is, is targeted in a sectarian manner, then it's, it's wrong on all sides. You know, you can't have, you know, you can't pick and choose. It's either wrong or it's not. There's no doubt that the 26 county state was, you know, the, the, the Catholic church were deeply embedded. And 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 running that state, and you can't defend that, and and Catholics suffered terribly at the hands of of the Catholic Church. You know, we're still dealing with that legacy. We're still looking at you know when we look recently at the Muller and baby homes, the 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 church inflicted grave injustice on the community. Uh, particularly the the, it's, it, the Catholic community, we look at what what uh, Edward Carson said about the whole issue of 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 partition. I think it's important to remember that where sectarianism came from, but it can be no you know it's it's wrong that we we do have two two states here, and I have you know I have as little respect for the twenty six county state as I would have for the, the, the six county state. It is not the republic that, that people had proclaimed and had fought for. Bonnie? I, I, I see the outcome as largely a negative one for all parties involved. Uh, more specifically in the North, um, you had unionists who had originally opposed home rule um, for the entire island, uh, who got to exercise it in an area of their choice. Um, in the South, you got a free state that had achieved independence within the empire, but then was still you know, quite tied to the British crown. And then to boot, you had the Catholic church that was further empowered in the South and affected every aspect of life, which effectively stymied I think the development of left-right politics along sort of a normal development path um, and stymied the spread of progressive uh, ideals and politics. Then finally, in both parts of the island, um, there were large majorities that were, or sorry, large minorities that were uh, resentful and rejected the legitimacy of the political system under which they, they found themselves. And then finally, um, in the border areas in both parts of the island, uh, those areas suffered quite a bit economically um, as a result of being dislocated from historical hubs, as you'd see in Derry, Donegal, um, or having to deal with two currencies and economies where before there had been one. Um, for instance, consider the Irish railway system, which soon after partition could not even operate without government support. And the only cross-border railway line now I think is from Belfast to Dublin so it sort of effectively cut off people's ability to to move around the island as well um so yeah mostly mostly failures Ray are you going to give us any good news are there any achievements of course uh, I, I think um 
it, it goes to show that, you know, partition in some ways worked for certain people because, you know, the, the, it created two societies, uh, essentially, which I don't like, but it, it did. And the perception would be very different for the majority of people in the Republic. The, the struggle in many ways uh, was successful in bringing peace to a very large area of, of the island of Ireland, which up for several hundred years had been involved in political violence and, and um, you know, ba basic mayhem. Unfortunately, it, cre it, it, cre it created um, a border which was uh, very injurious to um, both parts of Ireland, but particularly to, uh, obviously, the nationalist community in, in, in Northern Ireland. But the struggle uh, resulted in, a, in the creation of a truncated state in the Republic or in the South, as it was then, which took a long time to get up onto its feet. But over, if you look back at, you know, the last hundred years, the Republic has prospered in the last, the last quarter century thing. It finally got its sort of act together economically and, and that way. So it did create, the struggle did create benefits on, in, for people in the Republic. However, the people in the Republic who benefited were not the people who are engaged in the struggle. They were probably the people who are engaged in the, against the struggle. But I, I think people look at all this in the perspective of their own uh, experiences. And the experiences of people, uh, particularly in the South, uh, and particularly well away from the border areas, will be very different than people on the border areas and inside the North itself. So, you know, it's a mixed bag. Uh, and uh, to, to write it off as a complete failure, I think, would be unfair and probably wouldn't be accurate. To write it off as a complete success, obviously, wouldn't be uh, a success either. But there's a lot of unfinished business there. But we're, it's on a road, and the road is generally in a progressive way. I think, I think that's going to be the tenor of a lot of what our discussion is tonight, that it is going from... 100 years ago to now, what, what the road has been. I think Ray Bonnie has... As a question for you. Sure. So you said that one of the successes would have been that it brought peace to, an, to areas that had suffered a great deal of political violence. What areas do you have in mind? Dublin. Remember, Dublin. yeah, I mean, the, the, the War of Independence was fought very heavily in Dublin and right across the South. I mean, most of the violence in Ireland, political violence, was in the South, particularly in Munster. The struggle against the British rule was overwhelmingly in the southwest and in Dublin area. And these areas have been in political agitation for 200 years. So it, it, after the Civil War finished, it essentially brought peace to the, to the place. That's, that's, that, that, may be, that may be true, but then it just sort of offset the conflict and the violence to other parts of the island. Yeah, the, the, what happened was that um, essentially the, the, the British state and unionists essentially consolidated within the six counties. Remember, the majority of people in the six counties who were born in the 26 counties up until about 1991, or I, not consensus, were actually former unionists in the South that there was a movement of population up there. So essentially they consolidated that, that area there. Uh, the, also, you know, fairly soon, uh, uh, towards the end of the Civil War, Michael Collins had never really accepted the treaty and he was shipping weapons to uh, Republicans in, 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 in Belfast. He, with, with his death, and he was also paying the national teachers in, teachers in, the, in the North, with his death, uh, there was a, a decision made by the cabinet at the time, essentially, to accept the terms of the treaty. And that was, in many ways, a very big betrayal. But the people who signed the treaty did not have any really great intention of keeping the treaty. In other words, they regarded the North as unfinished business and would have moved on to it. But they did, they did bring, as I say, political violence to a large extent, or to almost entirely disappeared from you know, five-fifths of the island. Hmm. Okay. We'll start with you for the second question then, Bonnie, which is a follow-on from that. To what extent would you agree that the war ended in the reactionary foundation of a state divided on sectarian lines? 
and another confessional state? I actually agree wholeheartedly with that. <laughs> uh, I think, um, so uh, even picking up on a trend that Ray pointed out, like you could say that there was also a sectarian element in what happened in the South as well, even though it wasn't ethnic cleansing, there was effectively you know, an exodus of Protestants from the South as well. I think the domination of the, the church um, in the South until recent years was, and I mean, I think it had absolutely terrible consequences for any number of reasons for the lives of people in the South um, over the century. Um, but I, I, and then of course, I, the question of whether or not the state lived in the North was a sectarian one is, of course, it like the institutions that exist now are inherently sectarian. And therefore encourage parties to act in a sectarian way so it's i think yes they've had it's there there's nothing that you can say i think besides the south was a confessional state and the north was a sectarian one the same question to you ray yeah i think there's a lot of truth in that but remember the the reason that the south was a, uh, a confessional state was because that reflected the the the, the desire of a large section of the community. I mean, people, I went to Trinity College, for instance. Uh, my dad told me if I got permission from the Catholic Church to go to Trinity College and he can come home, he couldn't understand why people held themselves so much in, in thrall of the, of, 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 of the church. And the, the state was the same. And the Catholic Church had a very bad effect. There's no doubt about that. Right, it's not just since the creation of the Republic, uh, of, the, of the Southern state, I mean, for instance, the, the Education Acts in the middle of the 19th century, the church wouldn't cooperate with the establishment of primary education in Ireland because they weren't going to get control of it. So it's, you know, sometimes we were almost doubly colonized. We were colonized uh, by the British and we were colonized by the, the, the Catholic Church. But it took a long time to get out of that. And it probably reflected, unfortunately, the views of of, of, of a large sect of the Catholic community, North and South. Remember, there wouldn't have been any difference in terms of progressiveness between the Catholic population in the 1950s in, in Fermanagh or in, or in Cork. There wouldn't have been any difference in it. It's not a, it, it wasn't created simply because a state was created. You had a Catholic um, vice grip on the population as a whole. So, uh, and that was reflected very, very unfortunately in the way the state operated and the institutions of the state. Right, and, and it was also en enshrined in legislation and the constitution in, in various ways that made it even more difficult, I think, to break the stranglehold of the Catholic Church on the South. Gary? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah well, I, I don't think there's any doubt that the island was, uh, you know, divided along uh, excuse me, <clears throat> sectarian lanes and, you know, possibly to distract the working classes from other factors such as uh, the, the, the carve up, the distribution of wealth, you know, and it fostered a, a, almost a, a culture of, of, of them and us and uh, successive governments on, on both sides of, of, of the border. And I suppose in, in the United Kingdom, they did very little to uh, heal that divide uh, but you know they 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 put their wit behind the sectarian positions uh, and and the structures and you know that only perpet perpetuates the 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 situation uh, further. I think you know religion religion has been uh, has been used on all sides to to, to reinforce sectarianism and uh, you know this embedding religion in various constitutions and structures. Of the the state meant that it was uh, that it became uh, unnecessarily entangled with the whole uh, issue of sovereignty and identity. Uh, you know the, the the subsequent treaty divided the, the working class movement in a country like like never never before. The two state that when the two states emerged, they were both uh, poverty ridden, uh, sectarian, uh, backward, and they were undemocratic uh, creations. You know, one had a, a gerrymandered uh, unionist majority, and in the other, the Catholic Church was given uh, a lot of power and control. So I think it was, you know, society was knocked back 
uh, and became more clo uh, more closed, uh, you know, compared to maybe the twenty years previously. And and I think life just became, uh, you know, more tough for for working class people in both. And you know, when we talk about eradicating, and you know, when Ray is saying about the violence and that, but it also did it at least an awful violence from the church, you know, and, and we see the Mahler and Baby Home saga that's being played out now. So, you know, there was different forms of, of violence and, and the whole issue of poverty is, a, you know, is, is, is a form of violence in, in, in my view. A key feature of the war was the leadership role of the working class and labor. Do you see any similarities today? Yeah, I, I you know, I do, um, because my dad was very, was a very, very strong trade unionist, a great supporter of Larkin, and uh, he certainly felt that um, the whole Citizen Army people had been essentially uh, almost written out of, 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 of the uprising. And, you know, they, in, in the aftermath, the people who, who had gone out in the streets and did a lot of the fighting and things like that in for the, during the war of independence were, were completely ignored and um, so that there was a sort of as you say a bit of a counter-revolution uh, against those people um, and unfortunately a lot of the the, the more, were, were killed in the in the in during the during the or during the emergency period in the republic and uh, uh, particularly you know obviously Connolly was the was the was the sort of iconic figure on it but um the pe and I thought no, there was bitterness among those who had taken part in the in the in the war or what they call the War of Independence, that they were essentially often the people who were forced to emigrate, and the people who were busily, you know, helping the other side all seemed to prosper afterwards. Sorry, that's another. Sp I'll have to stop speeches. <laughs> Bonnie, so I I see some similarities to to today. Although I think what I talked about in terms of the institutions and the the, the types of governance that were um, set up after uh, the treaty um, and partition, that that sort of that stymied a lot of left-right political development and a lot of what we saw over the course of the 20th century was either sort of the absence of you know, progressive politics or progressive forces up until, and you and I have spoken about this cat up until like the civil rights movement. Um, but even after that, you know, you see left-right politics in the North as incredibly dysfunctional. They sort of left-right issues overlay parties, you know, on the nationalist unionist divide in sort of an awkward and non-intuitive way. Um, and it took um, the collapse of the power sharing government and intervention by Westminster to push through progressive reforms, which was bizarre. Um, so I think only recently in the North do you see the development of some sort of broader consciousness among the working class, um, particularly among uh, ex-combatants, ex-prisoners, um, and people who live in constituencies that would have suffered the most during the conflict. Um, it's, it seems to me as an interested outside observer that um, it's only over the past couple of years that there's been a number of connections made across communities based on working class interests and working class concerns. Um, I'd be interested to see whether or not that evolves into a broader political project that's able to challenge the sort of more sectarian institutions that are in place in the North right now. We're lucky because we have two of the people that are working on that here with us on the panel. Both Gary <coughs> and Julia have been working quite hard behind the scenes on exactly the projects that you're talking about. So Gary, do you want to jump in and say anything about it? Uh, the project or the, the question? Both. Well, look, I, I, I you know, I think that that from a Republican point of view, we have to cast bad nettle. We need there needs to be more engagement with uh, unionism. You know, uh, I've already, already marked out a future on this island, and and I think that 
the way to do that is at grassroots level. If we were to leave it to the politicians or the professional politicians, then it's never, you know, it's never going to happen. And I think that change needs to come. Uh, I think we've more that unites us than than divides us. Regarding the the uh, sort of you know the trade union and, and and that type of stuff, you know, I think that they're they're badly damaged and there's a number of things that have damaged them but you know probably the anti-trade union the thatcherite legislation has significantly uh weakened the power of the working classes the demand that their their rights are fulfilled you know when you look at working class you look look what happened in in, in the u.s with trump you look at what happened with the tories in in, in england you know i seen it on on uh, television where there was a, 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 a Mueller coming out of a food bank, uh, having availed that service for children and, and, and saying that she was going to vote Tory. Uh, you know, so I think in the, the, the sort of the union movement is, is, seems reluctant to take a position on the constitutional issue, uh, you know, regards the, you know, and, and, uh, the partition of Ireland. And that would be completely at odds with you know, Connolly, James Connolly's uh, vision and, you know, James Connolly's characterization of the task in Aaron's Hope, The End and the Means, written in, in 1987, was, you know, in my view, was correct. The Irish work, where he said, the Irish working class must emancipate itself and in emancipating itself, it must perforce free the, its country. You know, Connolly argued that the social and national questions were inextricably linked and again his, his essential conclusion was the need for the national uh, struggle to be placed in the context of, a, of sort of like you know, an overall struggle for the social emancipation of, of, of working class people i.e. that, that the, the struggle for national freedom could be could only be won in the context of socialist revolutionary change you know and, and I think the unions there's none of that in the unions, you know, we see Knight recently, who are big union here in the six counties, recently celebrating Armed Forces Day, or you know, it's just it's it's very despairing to be of him being honest. Bonnie, are you looking to jump in? Yeah, if I could ask Gary. Um, so does this mean that um, you know concerns? or preoccupations with working class politics or agitation at that level um, is only possible when it's placed within the context of a Republican struggle? And if so, then how do you get loyalists or unionists on board who, but probably more properly loyalists, who would be coming from a working class background and feel that their, you know, their economic needs and interests might be better met? Um, but for reasons of maybe identity, can't get over that being placed within the context of a, you know, of a all a united Ireland. Yeah, well, look, I, you know, I think we, unionist, uh, you know, working class unionist people are suffering every bit as much as nationalist or Republican. Uh, you know, we look at the, look at the history, they've always, you know, they've, they've been suffering as for the duration of, of the state and basically the, the, the unionist people have forgone a democratic future for its people for political dominance based on a on, on a sectarian uh head count that it, it's it's its future is almost now dependent on statistics uh most of which would, would be on its uh its own control or or uh influence and, and and you know i think it can be no doubt that the british establishment is indifferent to their uh, identity or their ethos, and and I think the greatest threat the uh, the the union is not from Dublin or from Republicans, but it's from London. You know, when it suits London, they'll throw them under the bus. And I think that we need to convince. Uh, well, I stand up, believe that they should have a, a veto, but I think we need to convince people that their their future is is here on the island of Ireland with. Uh, with you know, giving your place along with uh, with everybody else. Thanks, Bay. Are you looking to come in? Yeah, I, I, funnily enough, um, I, I have talking to loyalists in Belfast, um, particularly 
you know, um, I lived there for a few years, so I got to know uh, a fair amount, you know, particularly on the UDF side. And uh, I remember having discussions with them, uh, with the more, with the kind of more politically aware people, and they were saying that, you know, we understand the you have to understand the position we're in, that as long as the constitutional question is there, that's our priority. And I remember one of them sort of said, like, I would love to be a strong left wing community person talking about community issues. But my community is so scared about these things that this is my number one issue. He's also trying to tell me that they were direct descendant of the United Irishmen, that it was the other side that had moved away. Uh, but it, it was an interesting conversation. And he pointed out that, you know, the only time that you've had a good, strong growth of a left wing um, uh, groups in, in, in Belfast was, the, was, a, was probably the quietest period, which was the 60s, when the Labour Party, the old Northern Ireland Labour Party grew. He said, you know, at, at, we, we are preoccupied with the constitutional issue. And he said, until the constitutional issue is completely settled one way or the other, I can't see the loyalist people being other than being obsessed in this area. Now, maybe he's right, but he, 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 you know, and they said they were claiming that, you know, again, in the loyalists, even in the UVF, there's a lot of trade union people in the, particularly with Boilers, Wakers Union and things like that, that, you know, they were saying that the constitutional issue trumps everything else for their community. Uh, and I, 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 the, so the, the, the implication was until the constitutional issue is settled, uh, one way or the other, we're going to be in this position where we're on the defensive all the time. And the following question just for you then, Gary. It's about a motion that you successfully proposed through Derry City and Strabane District Council last month, stating that the council not celebrate the centenary of the foundation of Northern Ireland. Can you tell us practically what that means yeah. and also your reason yeah. for putting it to council? Well, you know, I, I just sort of done that, that motion. There was minutes where there was a bit of a squabble between DUP and Sinn Féin over the wording of the the state, you know. So I thought, you know, well, what is there to celebrate? What is there to commemorate? Uh, we, we would have, in effect, be commemorating or celebrating division. And if people want to do that or, do, you know, commemorate or celebrate that, then they're entitled to, but they're not entitled to do it uh, under the corporate position of, of uh, Derry City and Strabane District Council. So my, my motion was that council doesn't take part. And, you know, that was labelled sectarian. It wasn't a sectarian motion because when I talk about not commemorating partition, I'm also talking about, you know, not commemorating the the establishment of, of the Irish Free State or the 26 counties. You know, to me, that that is an equally uh, a legitimate state, you know, so, but that's the DUP. The DUP will put a sectarian label because that's their, their politics and that's how they, you know, got to where they are with this fear of, of uh, you know, playing on, on, on sectarianism and that. And since that, it seems they have uh, taken on a life of its uh, self. You know, it's created a lot of debate, which, you know, in my view, that, that is to be welcomed because, you know, it's, it, 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 and when we move forward in this country, you know, we need to be sitting down, we need to be preparing papers and, and, and how we are going to move forward uh, to make sure that everybody is, is, is included. The next question is just to Julia then, in relation to that. What are your thoughts on Gary's motion from a unionist perspective in Derry and Strabane Council? Well, I do think they're, device, they're divisive. Um, I think my main point so far has been that Northern Ireland was a safe place, right, um, for, the Protest for Protestant people. It was um, devised down sectarian lines. Um, uh, I don't think it was a good move. As I did work in council as a good relations officer at a time, and at times political decisions and um, political standpoints very much stunted good relations. And I think this is another example of how that's going to happen. Regardless of whether um, there's some people that think the formation of Northern Ireland was a good thing. In the same way that um, 
some people think that their religion is better or their religion, not necessarily better, sorry, is the best thing, is the good thing. Um, the way um, and the, the similarity between Christianity, say, and, and Muslims, you have to respect the fact. I think I think it has made people angry within unionist communities, and it's only going to uh, create more conflict. And the best way to try and move away from that conflict is to engage in dialogue rather than jumping. And I feel as if Gary jumped on his feet first. And it's very much coming from his own perspective, rather than trying to listen to everybody. The model of independent councillors is very much, as they say, based upon um, inclusivity, um, a new model of moving forward. Um, and this to me is looking back. It's not moving forward. Um, at the end of the day, Northern Ireland has a fiscal deficit every year annually of £10 billion. You know, economically, and I'm going to, I'm going to sound maybe guy like a typical unionist now, but economically, um, we would not have what we have in Northern Ireland if it wasn't for our um, UK our links with the UK. Um, there's no way that fiscal deficit <laughs> could be made up by Ireland or could it ever be, have been made up by Ireland. Um, you know, we are in a situation here in Northern Ireland where we can celebrate so much that we have. If we can, if we can pull in on what we have here and what we envisage going forward, you know, what, what do we have in common? What do we want? You know, do we want people to have an NHS? Do we want people um, to have strong, do we want people to have strong links uh, economically? Do we want, you know, do we want that for people? Um, and that's something that I would want to celebrate. Um, and I think it's been very divisive, particularly amongst working classes who don't necessarily um, will go down the lines of waving the flag, right? So how do we engage people, you know, that are going to wave a flag and, and, um, and have allegiance to the UK, no matter what? The one way we don't do it is a proposal that Gary made the council. Um, that is not the way we do it. That is not the way we engage with people. We don't piss them off. We try and understand. Um, we try and open dialogue. Um, and I think this is just another... Now, I know the SDLP are, are even back, not, not necessarily backtracking, but they're, they're trying to explain. I've seen them on social media explaining their decisions rights because they're starting to think about it. Um, you know, as far as a good relations perspective is, it's not, it, it's not a good way to make decisions and counsel. And especially with good relations, it's not as black and white as what Gary has made it and his proposal to counsel. So, Gary? Can I, well, look, I think some of the points that, that uh, Julia has made there, and you know, when she talks about the UK and, you know, and working classes, the biggest threat to working classes at the minute is the whole Tory situation, Boris Johnson and, 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 and his cronies who, who, uh, who, who are trying to get rid of the NHS, as, it, as, it, as it's called. They're, they're devastated working class communities. You know, the people of Scotland are very clearly gaining momentum. They leave the UK because they, they see that, you know, what's happening. The whole issue over Brexit 
and what that's doing the the communities you know when we talk about here about the about the health service and education and housing as being models to be held up yes there is a lot of positives in that but they're they're beginning to crumble they're they're, they're all being attacked by by the tories uh so there's a lot of you know when you when you look about scotland and how they're going and how they're thinking they don't share and there's no issue there's not the same there's no conflict over sovereignty within scotland yet they seem to be gaining momentum they they leave uh the uk in regards to the council when when you know when we talk about good relations there's an industry at the minute regarding good relations there's a funding industry and it's not genuine you know it's it's ticking boxes you will get a unionist group and a, a nationalist group they'll come together it's almost a carve up they'll tick the boxes they'll get draw down the funding and they'll help each other out regards solid genuine good relations it's not going to come through funded projects i have been been trying to promote better understanding dialogue with union people within the unionist community regards the independent model my problem with the independent model is there's not enough independence in in, in the council we have the big parties who will revert to orange and green. One of the problems we're not having enough is that there's not, there's no independent unionists. And I think that, that there is a lot to offer from people within the unionist community if they were to have, if, if, if Derry City and Strabane District Council had independent councillors from the unionist community, we will not agree on, on you know, maybe the national question, but I have no doubt that the the unionist working class community will be better represented by independent councillors and and, and and i would love to love to see that uh there's nothing there's nothing here to cheer about you know we can say you know about a safe place for protestants i think if that was the perception then that has moved on you know the the, the old idea of home rule is room rule you know, the, the Catholic Church has lost a lot of credibility from from the scandals. It has it has lost a lot of respect from within nationalist areas. It is not the same situation. It is not the, there's not that same perception. You know, one of one of the you know a lot of people pay lip service the dialogue and, and integration and one of the biggest problems and obstacles the integration is uh the catholic church and its state schools you know so we're we're in a we're in a, a different situation now but the reality is is that when we talk about when julia talks about working classes there's as many people from unionist working class areas who are getting on planes and heading off i i'm sure julia has neighbors and and relatives young people who have all left this country because they've had enough because you know we don't have proper housing we don't have proper education the health service is under pressure and i think some of the the problems is that when people look at a republic they they, they compare what we have in the 26 counties that is not the answer it is not a matter of extending what we have in the 26 counties and the six counties because that's not acceptable. And, and and any new, you know, dispensation, any new, whatever structures is going to be set up on this island, then, you know, there needs to be a very strong unionist input in it. It's their, as much their responsibility too to have an input in the how we go forward and what type of, of, of uh, structures and situation that we have in this, this, this island. Julia, do you want to come back on that? Well, I just want to say, you know, it's it's clear to me that it's okay to be in a social context now, Gary. 
whenever you are making a decision on, you know, putting this forward in council, um, you know, I think what, what needs to be understood is that there's people out there with different opinions, okay? And how do we, and how do you as a councillor, within that independent model, um, engage with those people? And that's not going to be achieved by completely opposing them with absolutely no consultation. Um, and that independent model is not going to work unless this happens. Um, therefore, that growth, the growth in the independent model, as you see it, won't happen in its current context of where you're at. Um, because people completely, like I've had people saying to me, what are you going on to talk there for? What are you going on? You know, it's like people completely disengage. And that's the last thing that you want to happen. The last thing that you want to happen. And remember that social context has to be taken in all instances, not just in the instances that sit. Um, another thing that I was going to say is, you know, and I'll go on about the economy, but me personally, I avail of thousands of pounds worth of drugs every month because um, because of something that, because of my MS. And there's no way that I could afford that anywhere else. That 10 billion fiscal deficit annually, you know, we cannot deny how that benefits our communities. We can't say, all right, um, and it's social context, it actually, that happens. We have £10 billion of a fiscal deficit in Northern Ireland every year, and it comes from the UK. So where, where, where's that from? You know, I just want to, where, where, where would that come from in your eyes, Gary? You know, how, how can we, how is that not a benefit of Northern Ireland? How is that not something they celebrate? How is um, housing not something they celebrate? How is the NHS not something they celebrate? You know, um, and you can talk, the Tories, I don't know how long they're going to last. I'm definitely, I can, I appreciate democracy and that they are democratically voted in. Um, however, I don't necessarily agree with the policies or all of them. Um, but, you know, what would we do without, how, what would how, we do? if Scotland go for independence, how is Scotland going to do all these things? You know, I think, you know, regarding, look, it's a, it's whatever they government. Have mm -hmm. you know, they have a lot, they have natural resources. Uh, there's natural resources in this country, I think, you know, and I think that, that, that Britain, given our, our, our involvement in Ireland, and, and the damage is done has a responsibility too. Has to have an input and has to have a financial input and they're trying to put this country back, right? When, when you talk about, I think, you know, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a right for people to have a roof over their head. Any country, any government needs to, 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 to supply that. They need to supply healthcare free at the point of, of delivery. And that's, that's what needs to happen. You know, why can't we pick the, the 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 parts of you know we're going in of, we we need to be going in with a blank canvas and we need to be saying well, let's pick the best bits of this and let's pick the best bits of that we have a duty you know we have a duty to our children we have a duty to our grandchildren it is not left in a particular model and saying let's extend that you know scotland you know have 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 all them things that you have outlined there but they're they're going it's only a matter of time. Right, so in, in the context now then, could you say that Britain still, if Ireland was to become unified, that Britain have a, an obligation to fund Ireland? What I'm saying is that the damage that Britain has done to this country, yes, they have, a, they have an obligation uh, for a financial package. Now, it's not for me to decide that what that is, it's for the, 
it's it, it's it's for this this island as a whole. But they they have a responsibility. They you know they just can't administ you walk away uh, from their responsibility. They have done an awful lot of damage here, and that's not. I don't think that will be unreasonable. All right. Okay. I accept that you don't find that be, to be unreasonable, but I would. Um, well, you look I, at the damage, you know, when, when you look the, at the damage that was... There's international, there's international laws, there's, there's obligations. That's, that's, that's the yeah. reality. You know... Uh, that doesn't apply to some people, Gary, but applies to the British government and, and Britain. Should apply to anybody who is who who has uh, caused damage and 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 uh, taken over countries or who who's you know interference of countries has, has has damaged it. They have an obligation. They 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 help put it put it back right. Can I can I mention a couple of things, just to, just by means of observation? Um, so first of all, I think, and it, I might have expressed this. Idea to, to Gary before, but um, I think I come at the question of the the council resolution is like from like a quintessentially American point of view, sort of live and let live. Why not let people celebrate as long as it doesn't affect you? Who who really cares? At the same time, you know, and it's a conversation that. I would love to have in depth with you, Julia, as well, because it's sort of like I, I'm not entirely sure. My perception from the outside is that unionists in Northern Ireland don't really, they don't really have it all that great. Like I'm not, I'm not really. So I'm, I'm just sort of. Part of me is wondering, like historically, what is it that unionists do want to celebrate? But that's like obviously coming from an outside observer's perspective. So it's wanting to understand that. I think then on top of this all, I think this entire discussion sort of obscures the fact that like what I've observed in Derry in all of my years in coming there is that the, the work that's being done there at a, at a working class level and for working class people seems sort of like above and beyond other places which is interesting to me because like it's sort of people that you wouldn't expect you know um you wouldn't expect given what you hear about um unionists what you hear about you know dissident republicans whatever you know so like what you hear from the outside and then you come in and you see the work that's being done and it's it's quite impressive and it makes one love the city even more so I think all of this, like, I'm I'm glad that the debate is playing out, but I, I also feel like it's a debate that also like will be one that's overcome because um, my understanding is that the precedent of the work that everybody's been doing together is quite meaningful. And this is sort of a, a good opportunity to talk about the differences that are there and probably will always be there, but are not as meaningful as the things that are making people work together. That's my little I think, my spiel. I think the last couple of questions may actually reunite people about the things that they're working together on. Uh, the question I had next, and I'll start this with you, Gary, is a key feature of the war was the leadership of the working classes in labor. Are there any similarities today, particularly given the conversation that you and Julia are having now? Well, I think, you know, the, we had Connolly, you had the likes of James Connolly, uh, Larkin, uh, you know, and, and, and their vision that, you know, they fought the, they build a movement, that, that socialist uh, movement, you know, you had, you had uh, Connolly, obviously Connolly was, was killed and Larkin was in the United States. But, you know, I think there needs to be unity amongst working class people i think that uh you know trade unions and people like that would have naturally had a huge part to play but unfortunately the state of the trade union movement at the minute you know it's it's they're they're constant they're, they're referred sometimes to as 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 thatchers 
union, given, you know, uh, you know, I think the, the evil of sectarianism is what divides the working class. It, 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 is, is, it is the biggest, uh, probably one of the biggest factors uh, at the minute. So I think that when we look what, what the Tories are doing, their, you know, their, their assault on the working class is equally as vicious on, you know, working class Protestants as it is on 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 the the working class Catholic community. Uh, it doesn't matter. The, you know, imperialism and capitalism doesn't take that in the uh, account. It's it, it has a job to do. I think that that there needs to be more dialogue. You know, we can disagree. Like I, I'm a Republican. I don't know why people would be shocked and that I would want to put a motion that we shouldn't celebrate, you know, partition. I, I, as a Republican, I want to see the end of the union. I don't want to see the end of Protestantism or the culture that's, you know, that's not what I'm about. But people shouldn't be shocked that my fundamental position is that I want to see the end of, of the union. And as I said, you know, the unionist people on, on this island have, have need to have an input in the, any plans that for the future of this country as a whole, not, not in a partition, but as a, as a whole. And, 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 and I've said this on numerous occasions, I would probably have more to fear than from some people who would be getting into power in a new Ireland that weren't unionists. I would probably have a lot more common in working class Protestants. And I would have as much to fear as, as, as working class Protestants and, 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 you know, and, and, and in a new Ireland. Because when people talk about, you know, there's been some commentary to say that this motion will make people outcasts and will make people excluded. There's nobody is excluded in communities as people who don't buy into the, the, the mainstream nationalist position. And there's hundreds and thousands of people in this community who, who feel outcasts every bit as much as if people in the Protestant community feel it. Julia? Yeah, um, Guy, it's okay saying, you know, that you're, you're not the very essence of unionism as the union and um, the very essence of unionism as that culture that you say you're not attacking. So by proposing what you proposed, you attack the very essence of that. Um, and that's how unionists see it. That's how working class unionists feel. Um, and, you know, I think, I think that, as I said, as I said before, I feel as if you, personally, I feel as if you just jumped down with your two feet and didn't think. Because even that statement saying that you didn't want to, you wanted to respect, people's, you know, where people were at within the unionist community. I think what that proposal did, it didn't respect that. And um, it has, it's been felt, felt more so at a grassroots level um, and in working class communities than what it has been anywhere else because it hasn't been talked about in higher political circles practically. Um, but it, it has been felt in working class communities. And, that, and that, that's probably because working class communities are more genuine. It hasn't been talked about in higher political levels. It's because they, they're not being honest. They're not being honest with their own communities and they're not being honest with each other. You know, you know if the SDLP say they're a Republican Party, then they want to see an end of the union. If Sinn Féin say they're a Republican Party, then they want to see an end of the union. Now, 
if that's your position, then you need to come out and say it. And, and all I have done is saying that we should not be celebrating the biggest source or cause of division in this country as a corporate body. And it wasn't a knee jerk, it wasn't jumped in. That, as a Republican, is, 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 is a, fund a fundamental position to adopt. Now, there will be people who will disagree with that, but they should not be surprised. And if they're surprised at the parties for backing that, it's because the parties aren't being honest. I know, but as a rate payer and as, as somebody who lives in this council, you know, I do not expect that corporate body to go against what I believe in. You know, and there's a, a lot of other people in our city who feel the same. Yeah, um, and there's thousands in this and in, in, in nationalist areas who are disenfranchised from the council, and it may not be over issues as fundamental as the union or partition. It could be down to help. It could be down to funding. It could be down to that. There is as many, if not more, people in the nationalist community who don't think they're getting a fair deal for their for their rights and 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 are outcasts and, and excluded. Within the PEL community as well, guy that feel the yeah. same. So it's you not know. unique. It's not no. unique. And 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 to be honest, we if there was a, a proposal, I. That, that the, the council should celebrate 1916. In my view, they would be doing it for the wrong reasons because their vision of, or their narrative of 1916 would not be an accurate one. And, and, and you or I should not have to pay for that. If I want to celebrate 1916, I will do it. If people within the unionist community want to celebrate the, the union of 100 years, by all means, but centenary, but, should not pay for it. but centenary um, of 1916 were supported and supported by council and their officials. So why should this be different? Well, I, I had you no know, input or I, I didn't attend or, or not, was not at any of them. And it wouldn't be. You probably did without realising. Honestly, there was numerous um, uh, celebrations that were supported by council around 1916. There was also a consultation do done around centenary celebrations by the Good Relations officers that just seems to have gone, you know. I would just say that um, I think one one pressing question, and this is it's something that I think has come up now and, and something that I'm really interested in, I think is very consequential, is the question of sort of, you know, there's there's the idea that you can't, I'm gonna, you know, sort of butcher the butcher the quote, but it you can't you can't have freedom without, you know, liberation. You can't have liber liberation without freedom, sort of marrying socialism and republicanism. And I think whether or not one of those has to give, um, and which one is a priority, or if one of them needs to be a priority might become a pressing question in the next few years um so i and i and i think that this is sort of like the beginnings of conversation surrounding the, ten, the potential tension between those two concepts while it seems like there is a logic that brings them together as well so um but at the same time i think it's i'm it's it's heartening that there's still discussion going on over something that's on the surface, very controversial, but obviously a very civil conversation going on about it. No, I, I was I was saying to, to Gary that I, I thought a lot about this. I asked my students in class the other day, um, you know, what what would they think if there were a group of people who wanted to commemorate the or celebrate the Confederacy in a state like Mississippi or something in a predominantly black area? And half of my students thought, right, go ahead, just let them go, that's fine. Um, I think it veers toward that free speech absolutist end, which I think is quintessentially American. Um, and then some people said, and I, I was happy that they said this, you know, let them have it, but they need to explain what they think is good about the Confederacy. There's also, I there's, 
there have been, been thinking a lot about speech lately because there's some people that I, in American politics that I would like to not hear speak. Um, but I, I think there's in law and then in, in norms as well, um, there's different ways that we can regulate speech and regulate celebrations. And I suppose, you know, if it's my position would be is if a celebration weren't harming anybody else wasn't not affecting anybody else so just you know in private homes or things like that then i would say i don't see a reason why people can't celebrate it although i am curious about what what exactly it is that they would be celebrating so yes okay all right Okay. We'll start with you for the next can question I, then, Ray. Agree, can I agree with uh, Fanny, but, you know, we won't be celebra in, celebrating in whatever, two years time, uh, the 100th anniversary of the, of the, of the foundation of the, of the Irish Free State. It also brings back people to uh, be reminded that, the, that, you know, the treaty didn't divide Ireland. Ireland was well divided before the treaty. You know, they, Britain divided Ireland in 1920 Act. It wasn't, it wasn't something that, you know, was decided over in, uh, over uh, during the negotiations with Michael Collins. Uh, and sometimes people get that, get their wires uh, crossed on that because partition had occurred almost two years before the Irish Free State was founded. Uh, and I, 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 it, it's useful that, I, I think there's no harm in people noting it. Um, and remember the person who was responsible for the establishment of, 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 of the state of Northern Ireland, Carson, would never have celebrated to celebrate the the, the the establishment of the northern state. He 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 wanted to try and keep the whole place inside the United Kingdom, and he played the Ulster card to try and do that. And in the end, he wouldn't go to to to, to Belfast or anything, or become part of the of the regime up there. So you know, I think it's a historical event. It should be noted. And it's, but I don't. I, I wouldn't see a role for a council like Derry and Straban to celebrate that in any way. If people want to do it in their private homes, fine, but you know, why would you celebrate that? Um, what was, you know, ushered in, you know, pogroms in Belfast and various things like that. Uh, it, it'll, be, it'll be very, very divisive. Can I come in, Kat, just a wee comment? I think, Ray, you know, what you're saying there about Carson, when I was getting sort of, you know, going over this in my mind today, at the, you know, the whole, Carson's speech of what a fool I was, I was only a puppet and so was Ulster, came to mind, you know. But just to go back to Bonnie about, you know, she talks about the Confederacy. The Confederacy is gone. The partition is still here, but I, I get I get the spirit of, of, of what you were saying. And I think, you know, what what is it that has to be celebrated? You know, when I, when I put my motion, I was told that I was being divisive. So in effect, what people were saying or what, what unionists were saying was that because I don't celebrate or commemorate the vision, then I was being divisive, you know, and I think there was a, 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 a program on Radio Ulster this week when a, a, a local DUP councillor was asked, well, give us, you know, basically it was give us what you want to celebrate and, and was asked on three, three occasions and for some reason didn't take the opportunity, which only leads people like myself, they believe that, you know, there's nothing there. Yeah, Gary, the other thing is, remember, local government in Tyrone was suppressed at partition because the council in Tyrone and Fermanagh objected. So they actually abolished the local yeah. council. So it's a bit harsh for a local council to be in an area which covers part of Tyrone to be celebrating something where, you know, that was essentially yeah. forced on them. And in fact, local government was suspended in those two counties at partition because the two county councils wouldn't cooperate. This was before the, the gerrymander in terms of, of, of turning Fermanagh and Tyrone into unionist dominated councils. But while there was a fair system, they, 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 the, the anti-partition people had a majority in, in the council in both Fermanagh and Tyrone and it was necessary for the government to close them down to, 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 to do it. So, it's a minor point, but it's, it seems strange for a for a council whose predecessors had been suppressed, anti-democratically suppressed, that they should be celebrating. Sorry, that's my speech for the day. I won't do another one. 
The final question to all of you is, I'm conscious of the fact that we're the penultimate session in the full conference and the final session is going to be looking at the democratic program for the 21st century. So it's kind of the way forward from here. So I'd like us now for the last wee bit of the debate to talk about moving from 1920 to 2020. What were some of the lessons that have been learned through the struggle and the war? What implications do they have today? And what can we actually do, particularly given that this is one of the most diverse panels as part of the conference? What does that mean in terms of the democratic program for a 21st century? Bonnie, we'll start with you. So if you look at the struggle for independence, I think that there are, and then, what comes after immediately after it. I think there are a couple takeaways that are important to think about today. Um, coming up on 100 years of uh, partition. First would be the tendency within the Republican movement, I think, to fracture and um, in some ways be undemocratic um, over time, depending on you know, specific groupings that might develop. Um, but I, I, th I think what's concerning about, about that is that there seems to be, in some cases, um, Republicanism sort of falls by the wayside and people rally around specific charismatic personalities or leader personalities, and um, then groups become all about that one person or just a couple of people. Um, and that's not helpful because then it doesn't open up uh, debates and ideas uh, about moving forward. So, and it also, another, another problem with that is that it uh, hampers the ability of anybody who would call themselves a Republican to join together and um, act in one broad political project that might be effective at challenging the system as it stands. Um, one other takeaway, and it's not necessarily the struggle properly um, in, in and around 1920, but just after um, there was the financial agreement of 1925 in which the Irish Free State um, had agreed with um, Britain that 80% of the public debt that Ireland had the Republic of Ireland had taken on would be forgiven, but what that implied and what they gave up in return for that was a redrawing of the border according to the wishes of the inhabitants uh, there. And um, I think what that tells me is that, you know, we need to be conscious of more macroeconomic transactions, trends, deals um, that governments have the power to make, um, especially as we're coming up on Brexit and the economic crisis, fallout from COVID and potential talks about where borders should be. Um, so there's a number of um, potential trade-offs that people in power can make um, that I would say need to be paid attention to. Ray? Yeah, Bonnie, just to let you know, that that was British national debt. At the time of partition, the treaty was a terrible treaty. You know that the Irish the new Irish Free State had to take a chunk of the British national yes. debt. Yes, I, I know that was the British national debt, yes. Yeah, which, which, yeah. which they should never have done. I, I Sorry, I, I, I have a obsession on that. It was the yeah. worst treaty possible, but they, they, they took it. I think if you're going to, pro, if you're going to push a progressive agenda uh, for the 20, 21st century, Number one, you have to have a coherent message. And but the the other thing is that anyone who's pushing uh, an, a, a progressive agenda in Ireland, wherever north or south, has a huge problem in that in their ability to get it across to the public. Because we have it's a, you know there's 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 just under seven million people in, in on the island of Ireland. It is a very small area. There's uh, you know the the the, the mass. The mass media is under the control of very a very small number of people, and it 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 has its own narrative. And if you move away from that narrative, you're regarded as a nut, or you're regarded as you know you just it, it, it's very. The point I'm saying is, anybody who's going to get a, a message 
uh, across. Number one, they have to have a clear and coherent message, which makes sense to the average person. And secondly is, the one thing you'll have to look at is how you actually get that across to the general public, because it's not easy. So it's packaging more than it is content. Well, I, I think you have you have to you have to have the you have to have the product first. I don't believe that you can sell you can sell snake oil. But the <laughs> point is, even if you even if you've got if you've got gold, just try and get it across. Try and get the Irish news to to print something. Try try and get the the you know the dairy news to print something that's radical. There'd be almost there'd be, at the bottom of it. At the bottom of it, there'd probably be a disclaimer. This guy's a nut. <laughs> Right, Gary, Gary, how are we getting the dairy? Uh, no. Something uh, radical? <laughs> well, look, I want to I quote Paul Johnson, who was one of Britain's most distinguished uh, journalists, and he was one of Mar Margaret Thatcher's most ardent supporters. And he once wrote in, in the New Statesman, in Ireland we have tried every possible formula, direct will, indirect will, genocide, apartheid, puppet parliaments, real parliaments, martial law, civil law, colonisation, land reform, partition, nothing has worked. The only solution we have not tried is absolute and unconditional withdrawal. Why not try it now? It will happen in any event. There's other people like the Anglican theologian, John Austin uh, Baker, former Bishop of Salisbury, you know, who laid the, the blame of what's happening here firmly where, where it belongs. And that's, that's in England. I think that, you know, the only way that we can uh, move forward is by uh, a withdrawal uh, from this country, you know, and allow the by the British and allow the people to to implement, you know, their their own government, their own systems, and that includes uh, unionism. Uh, I think there's too many people who are comfortable, who 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 say pay lip service to republicanism, but they're in fact they're happy enough with the status quo and don't want to be challenging it. And anybody who does challenge that, you know, is is is, is described uh, or put them one of the categories. Uh, you know, and I think, and it's the type of society that, that we want coming out of that, you know, that the, there will always be manipulation of, of the working classes, you know, and they're the most of the people who are impacted by, by any sort of uh, struggle or conflict. And the, the political uh, elite will continue to thrive regardless of the outcome, you know, and as I said earlier, we look at what's happening in the US or even England, you know, where you have people who are completely polarised and you have working classes pitted against each other, uh, you know, and that that's the, the, the sort of the distraction of, of the elite, you know, divisive uh, uh, politics and prohibitive legal frameworks of a state, any, any state is a way of, of, of justifying and reinforcing the, the, the inequalities. Uh, you know, so I think, you know, when, when we, what we don't want is an extension of the 26 counties into the six counties that wouldn't that be something that I would want or an extension of, of what we have in the six counties. You know, I think we, we, we pick the best of, of it all. We start with a blank canvas and, and that's where, where we need, need to be at. How we get there, it's going to be difficult, but you know, this, this problem has been going on uh, centuries. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done. It remains just then for closing remarks from everybody. Bonnie, I think you have something you wanted to come in with and then we'll let everybody have a wee bit of a say before we thank you all for your time. Sure. So um, I think my, the overarching theme of the ideas that I've picked up on and tried to put forth are um, sort of the dysfunctional or non-functional development of left-right politics on the island of Ireland, North and South um, over time. And I realized that one thing that um, uh, we haven't really talk, talked about um, is really the rise of right-wing politics um, in the Republic and then sort of now creeping north and, and being everywhere throughout Ireland. And so I, I just think that that's, it's interesting because while I think the, the Republic of Ireland uh, had a very, because of it, the Catholic Church's influence had a very conservative uh, element within it um, that at the same time, uh, Ireland is one of the last countries in Europe to see the development of a far right. And the way that I see it sort of mixing in and appealing to what would be called Republican ideals is a bit um, disturbing. And I think, uh, you know, 
developing progressive politics um, and an understanding of right wing groups and their ideologies or lack thereof is an important thing to do moving forward um, in order to challenge um, you know, destructive, xenophobic or, or other non-helpful policies that are advocated by the far right. Ray? Yeah, I, I, I suppose I was a bit all over the place. <laughs> There's no harm on that. Uh, I, I, I think one thing you've got to take into consideration, most people in the Republic are happy with the Republic. That's something that, that you, I, I, I have family in Derry and I've, I've, I'm in Belfast. Most people of a nationalist background in the North aren't happy with their state. Um, and I think you have to shake, the, you have to, you know, sort of open the eyes of people in the Republic, particularly, you know, the further south you go, uh, that, you know, that there is another way, there's a progressive way, and that, it, you know, that... Um, they are the inheritors of a long struggle and uh, they need to um, you know, take into consideration um, conditions in the North and um, you know, that they should not allow themselves to, be, uh, to, 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 to trade one false god with another false god. You know, there's a tendency in the Republic always to have a, a nice big brother who looks after you. And you know, before this was the empire and that now they, they, they have this idea that, you know, everything that's, that comes from Brussels is great. And I think they're in for a rude awakening. Sorry for my rambling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, well, I would say, you know, most people on the, the island are, are, are not happy with partition or, or, or what we've got at, at here. You know, and, and I listen, Bonnie, what you're saying, you know, some of the ideas, but I think, that can't happen. It's impossible with the system that we have in place, with both systems, the systems that we have in the six counties and the system in the 26 counties. I think that this is, you know, that that needs to be changed, you know, root and branch. The, the tinker with that system uh, is it's akin to probably rearranging the, the deck chairs on, on, on the Titanic. Any final thoughts from anybody? Well, then it just remains for me to say thank you very much to all of you for participating in the debate. It's been very interesting in terms of a, a quick sort of slapdash look over 100 years and where we are now from a fairly diverse bunch of people and views. Um, and I, I, I hope everybody who's engaged with it has, has taken away a, a wee bit of a, a challenge and perspective from, from people who maybe think slightly differently than they do. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck. What do we do now? <laughs> How do we close it? <laughs> then for me to say thank you very much. I think this is one of the more diverse panels that we've had, and I'm delighted that we've had the likes of Julia and Ray to come and talk to the Potter O'Donnell Socialist Republican Forum, as well as for for Gary and Bonnie to participate in the panel. I know we haven't necessarily reached a consensus, but we have actually talked about certain things that are part of the platform that we all need to think about taking forward including including unionists and people from other dissenting positions within what we need to talk about for the program of government for the 21st century. <laughs>